Welcome to the Look It's Rock and Roll podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill, and today I've got Project Gemini's mastermind, Mark Anthony K, back with me. He's got the forthcoming release of, well, in the year 3073, book three coming. So, uh, Mark, welcome back to the show on the other side of the table. Hello, Julian. It's great to be back. And yeah, it's uh, it's different to be on this side of the table every once in a while, but, you know, it's, it's fun to do these sorts of interviews. Yeah, I always enjoy getting people who create music to talk to you one-on-one and dig into, you know, some aspects of the recording process that has, you know, led you down the path. Obviously, book three is the culmination of your In the Year 3073 project, and it's going to be released digitally on January the 21st. Um, Just at the top of the show, why don't you let people know where they can find Project Gemini and more about the release of the project? Um, there's two places where obviously you can get the most information and that is if you go to the Facebook groups that I have which is the Project Gemini group and the Project Gemini fan page those are usually the ones where I update them quite a bit also there's a Riffical Records page now as well on Facebook which you can find and luckily it's the only you know label that's called Riffical Records so in the search it'll be easy to find Uh, but all the information is you know, kept pretty current on there as far as what's going on. So that's a good place to do it. And the other good place to check on things is my band camp, which is uh, obviously Project Gemini. Uh, In the search there, there's no other Project Gemini like that. So it should be very easy to find that on the band camp as well. With January the 21st rapidly approaching, thank you for the advanced listen to book three. I must say um, it has led to me playing all three albums in sequence (laughs) and getting the full two hour plus experience of the story plus with adding in uh one of the songs from your one of your record store day releases uh kind of into the mix where i think it slotted in but i absolutely love the beginning of this album so i there are elements in this discussion that i don't want to spoil for other listeners um that me as a listener uh, would be kind of um, upset if I knew they were coming before I got my copy mm-hmm. of the album. So I'm going to stay away from there, those uh, kind of areas. And uh, people, when they purchase the album or listen to it on Bandcamp, will be able to make those judgment calls for themselves, whether I got it right or wrong. But, you know, straight out of the box, did you feel any pressure with the approaching, you know, book three? This is it. You've always said it's going to be a trilogy. And knowing that this is the culmination, this is where you lay all the cards out musically and on the story. Yeah, well, I would be lying if I said that I didn't feel a little bit of pressure, only because not so much about the fact that it's the third book and I got to get it right. It's more that I always keep my albums between 40 and 43 minutes long. And can I do that in that time? Can I wrap this up in that time? That was the main concerns I had. Can I write the ending of this within the 43 minute or 42 minutes or whatever time slot? And I think I did a decent job of that. Uh, I think it ends up well. Uh, I think that this one out of the three, I spent a little bit more time going back to it putting it aside, coming back to it later, re-listening to it, making sure I still felt the same way about the story as I went through it, if I felt the same way about the music as I went through it and recorded it. And this uh, this album probably has the most amount of mixes I've done per song. I think, uh, geez, uh, I think the, the the first song on their um, uh, man, man Your Stations, I think I have like eight mixes of that song that I did. And it's not like they were like, drastically different mixes from mix to mix there was always like eh, i don't like how this guitar is sitting maybe put it up higher or this needs to come down a little bit it was just always little minor things but you know those little things can affect the whole scope of it so you got to be very careful with that i find when you do mixing uh but overall i think the story ends decently one of the things i like about the way i did this story overall is it's a bit of a roller coaster book one seems to be like a very uh, positive, uplifting sort of story and uh, part to it. Book two is a total 180, where you know these people who we thought were such friendly people seem to be the villains. And now in book three, 
you know, another twist is added to the story in there. So I don't, I don't want to give too much away. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm curious about one thing. Six songs on the album, and it starts with an instrumental. Now, you'd mentioned that when we talked for the release of the Holy Shield uh, single back in November. I, I'm curious, did you feel there was any risk in starting off an album with an instrumental? Uh, yeah, there, there's always a, an element of risk to that. But I always looked at my instrumentals to have a certain specific uh, purpose to them. Like on the other ones, the, the instrumentals I kind of looked at as the part where the credits were rolling, the sort of background music to kind of take you out of the story. And this one, I wanted to make an instrumental that was a little bit more upbeat, a little bit more intense, because in part of, in part of the story, there was something very big that was going to be happening during this part. So I wanted to kind of emphasize the importance of this part with a more kind of uh, intense instrumental and i mean lots of bands have done it i mean i keep thinking of 2112 overture what a big grandiose way to start off a record right so you know and not to say that i would put myself in the same bracket as 2112 overture but i had the same kind of idea to kind of grip you at the beginning kind of catch you you know and make you stand to attention and what's going on here sort of thing with this music and then it goes right into the story from then on in so that's a, a great starting point because one of the first things I notice with the music on this album, and it's perhaps because it, more of the instrumental um, being the first experience of listening to it, was that keyboards uh, have a very prominent role on this album, um, particularly this song. Maybe it's just because there, there aren't the vocals competing with the atmospherics delivered by the keyboards. But was that something that you made a, a decision about that you wanted to feature keyboards or anything more um, prominently on this album as part of the story? Um, I never really went in with the idea of saying that this record, I'm going to have much more keyboards on it, but I, I'm never afraid of trying things. If, it's, if, it, if it jumps into my head saying this part can really use an organ or it can really use a sort of Mellotron part or something or a sequencer part, I'm, I'm always open to going more into that. Now, um, ever since I started working with Joe in The Dark Monarchy, uh, he's a really big into keyboards and sequencers and stuff like that. And he loves doing orchestrations and stuff. And working with him on that stuff kind of got my juices flowing more on the keyboard and the stuff. So now what I seem to do is I go through every single song with each keyboard that I have and just go through every single thing. I mean, sometimes I've spent like two, three days just going through my keyboards, finding different sounds and trying them, trying this sound and that sound on a part. Oh, I don't know. I don't like this one. I'll try this part. It's I, I just wanted to just make sure I didn't leave any stone unturned this time. This is the last part of the story. It's the conclusion. You know, I'd hate to go back and say, geez, I wish I would have went back and tried that sound I was thinking about in this part. Yeah, so you mentioned something interesting about the character of each of the books in this story. Book one is very positive, book two is darker, and book three is twisty um, mm -hmm. in, in that sense. In the time since that first book came out, how has your technology or your gear changed, and has that changed how you approach telling the story musically as well? Um, the gear, funny enough has not changed very much at all. And which is sort of surprising because when I, before I started doing this, I kind of made a note to myself that, you know, maybe I should get myself a new sound card or a new interface. Maybe I should get myself a new mixer board because some of the preamps are starting to get a little dodgy on it. Uh, but I never got around to doing it. I just started doing the record mainly because when I started doing my demoing of it, all these ideas started coming to me like, oh, and you know, when you get into the flow of things, it must be the same when you're writing a book, I'm assuming that when you start writing and things are coming out, the last thing you want to do is just, you know, let me put it aside now while everything is coming to me and, and go get something to, you know, like go get some more papers. And I, I think you just would be rather just do the thing, sit down with it and go through it. So I never really went out and got anything as far as new tech for this. It's all the same stuff since book one. But it's just, I think I've dived deeper into the stuff that I've had. Like the keyboards, I tend to sometimes go back to the same sort of patches. But this time I really went through and tried other stuff that I never really used before.
on record. So there's a little bit more uh, broadened palette of sounds. Yeah, and that's something else that seems to be a change from the previous installments as well. Um, not that there's ever been an overly heavy load of additional voices, either musically or vocally, on them, but you seem to have decided to rein in those external contributions somewhat on this and taken a far more personal approach to the music and the performance. What prompted that decision? Um... It's it's interesting. Um, I always knew that I needed to have Joe in it. If he was from the, in it from the very beginning, and he was always sort of my alter ego or altered voice in the album. So, uh, I I always kept it that way as far as vocals. It's never been more than just me and Joe. And the bass player thing, well, I thought was a fantastic idea when I did book two, and it worked out really well. Uh, the reason why I didn't do it this time around was a few reasons. Number one. The COVID situation started lessening at a certain part when I was working on it. So people started going back out on tour, i.e., you know, Lee Pomeroy and, uh, you know, even uh, Billy Sherwood started getting more involved with the Yes stuff and Arc of Life and some other stuff. So he became much more, uh, you know, taken up in his time. Now, that's not to say that he didn't want to do it. He very much wanted to do it, but our schedules just didn't kind of click on that end of stuff. Uh, and he will be doing stuff in the future with me. We've already agreed on that, you know, just not this album. But I also kind of looked at it this way. This record was the conclusion. It's, it's a very important record in my eyes. And I wanted to make sure I ended it a certain way. And I didn't want to take too much of a chance having somebody else uh, take over certain parts of the play because I wasn't sure if they would get what I was looking for on certain parts. You know, and that's not to say that Lee Pomeroy or these guys don't have the skills to do what I want. They obviously do and probably more. But it's a very personal thing, songwriting. And when you foresee how you want something to end or how you want something to sound, only you kind of know that, right? So I took upon myself to do a lot more of the bass play on this album. Uh, a lot more of the singing is me on here as well. Joe is on here, obviously. But, you know, I think I took upon the, the storytelling more on my shoulders this time. Yeah, I seem to hear quite a bit of like vocal multi-tracking going on where you're singing your own harmonies um, on songs and they're just flawless and seamless and they seem to work very well. They're, they're honest, number one. They are all you. And I'm not saying that a different voice wouldn't be just as good, but I don't see there need to be a different voice singing those parts to me as a listener. So mm -hmm. um, the story arc, I mean, how much of the story arc have you known is coming to this point? Um, <clears throat> and did the story kind of drive? This has been several years of your life uh, in coming to this stage. So you know, how much of the flow is was there and did any of it change once you actually started actively writing and demoing? Good question, Julian. Um, actually, that's something that uh, I think a lot of people would probably want to know because I know that when people have interacted with me over the years, I'll, as this album has been and story has been told, people have always been asking me, do you know how it's going to end? Do you know how it's going to end? Like even at the beginning of book two, when I released book two, people were saying, do you know how this is going to end? And I never really wanted to tip my hat on that. And I didn't really know at that point how I was going to end it. But what I decided to do was I didn't want to start going full force on recording this record until I had actually outlined how the story was going to end. So because I wanted to know what the flow of the story was going to be as I wrote the music for it. Right. So I worked it out. Uh, it took a little while, and what I did too, just to make sure that I kind of committed to it to some level was, and I think you got this too, was I sent out a package to a bunch of Gemini Club people that I sent out these little uh, specialty sort of folders that had like, you know, official documents from the, you know, the NAS military forces and stuff like that. And I wanted to make sure that those pieces were sent out to people because, yeah, there it is because I wanted to make sure that some of the things that I mentioned in there, I used in the storytelling. There you go. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that that was put into the story. And what better way to make sure I do that than to put it out there? Because wouldn't it be foolish if I sent that out and then never included any of it in the story? You know what I mean? So 
I I did that and I wanted to make sure that those parts are put into the story. Now, the very, very ending of the story, I'll admit, has changed twice since I wrote it. Because at first I was like, eh, this ending seems a little too dark for me. And then I tried another version of it and that one seemed a little too uncertain of an end. Like, really? That, that almost seems too much like a cliffhanger again, right? And then I did another version of it, which I was happy with, which kind of added both elements, darkness and a teensy, teensy bit of a cliffhanger. Yeah, that's the impression. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that ending when we get, when we go, uh, you know, to some of the other songs on the album. Uh, I'm curious about one thing, though. When you're writing music, can that music change your narrative, your story? You know, you, you, let's say you come up with a great song. And you, you, you start writing it with a particular part of the plot in mind, perhaps, or vice versa. I have no idea how your creative process actually works. I mean, have you, have you encountered that? Um, well, it's happened where I had a lyric written, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to write the music for this now. And it has happened where I've written it, and I'm like, wow, I really like this but it's not giving me the kind of feel I wanted. It's not mellow enough or it's not wacky enough or it's not heavy enough. So I'll take that music, put it aside and go through my lyrics and say, okay, well, what would this fit with? And I've been lucky that it has worked out that way that it's complemented some of the other lyrics. And I gotta be very careful with that because if you write a song that complements a certain story part and let's say it's a total long epic that's totally slow, like a really draggy thing. You don't want to end a record like that. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you have to be careful with that. So it has, it has happened where I've written music and it didn't fit the lyric or I've written the music and the lyrics just didn't fit the groove of the, of the uh, wording. Like let's say I've had a, a verse that I really liked and I just couldn't get the words of the verse that I wrote to fit in it no matter how I tried. That's happened a couple of times where, I, where I've had that happen. So, uh, but for the most part, uh, I've, been, I've been lucky. I've had most of what I've written, I'd say about 87% of it has fit what I've written. Nice. So going back to the opening instrumental, I'll just give you some of my comments and respond to them if, if you want. And if not, we'll mm -hmm. just go through some of the songs. Um, I've already mentioned the keyboards uh, on the instrumental, but the thing I love about the song is the great guitar harmonics. Um, you're, 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 you're pinging away there. Uh, <laughs> but the, the bass, that's mar that seems to be your signature, that kind of bass. It's, you know, to me, with my musicals, perspectives of background, I often, you know, call it the Steve Harris galloping bass, you know, because mm -hmm. you're really kind of chunking along rather than playing in a more progressive vein. Um, again, to, to my perspectives. And then your keyboards are zipping around. They're really doing a great job of setting a, a tone and an atmosphere without any words. Admiral Worthington, though, them mm -hmm. threats. <laughs> your, your, your connective tissue, you know, you, you've got a fair amount of connective tissue there. Uh, so it doesn't feel like Kisses Elder where that is missing to tie in where you're going. How important is that or challenging to balance uh, spoken word with the music? Uh, I think it's important. I think it's very important because for me, for something to have connectivity, there has to be familiarity as well, right? Uh, so when I had, uh, con you know, decided that in book two I was going to end it with, you know, Admiral Worthington the fifth showing up and you know giving the ultimatum, I thought it was just as important that he make a reappearance at the beginning, almost sort of like when people get the record and sit down with it and say. When they hear him, they go, oh, yeah, I remember. That's how book two ended. You know, and that already joggles the brain, quickly makes you go back to the story. Now I remember how it ended because, you know, some people might not have listened to this record for, let's say, a few months, maybe a year. Who knows? And they just maybe not have remembered exactly how it ended. But that that little part alone will joggle a lot of memory, I think, to people about how it ended at least. And then you'll get the story back in your mind. So it's it's really important, and uh, you know again big props to Ken Mills. So who did that? Actually, he is the the uh, mighty Admiral Worthington the fifth, 
And uh, the difference this time is that I added in the response because when in the book two, there was no response given. This time the response is given and we move forward from there. Uh, the bass playing on this was one of the songs where I was looking at initially to give it to somebody else to do, but I took it back into my lap and I was happy I did it because I think that the bass playing I saw would have been different than the person who I had in mind to do it would have done. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I'm happy with the way it turned out. You know, and again, it was sort of the thing where I had my bass, I had my Ampeg DI box that I had that specially made when that Ampeg made a few years back so I can get that sort of Ampeg tone and it it just worked out really well. And the keyboards, that was one of the songs where I was like, you know, got out everything out. I had this one out, I had my Gaia, I had the little small uh, other Nor the North Norv Novation base station out. I had everything in the kitchen sink out for this one because I wanted to make sure that I added as much sonic coloring to this as possible. Excellent. Uh, it's it's a really good start off to the album. We go into the whole issue. We spoke about that in November, but comparing the single mix with the album version, um, I must say, you know, two completely different beasts now. I mean, it is a the single remains a good representation of the song, but hearing it within the context of an album makes it a completely different listening experience. I, the super crunchy guitars, I still really really like, and uh, again chorus the value of a chorus in a song is so critically illustrated here because that chorus is so melodic and catchy it, it's just absolutely fantastic how much twiddling do you have to do um between that single version done in well october and november you know last mm -hmm. year and integrating it um into the album because i know you always treat mixes very very carefully depending not only on the album but whether it's a single yeah well the it, it was a, like a fair bit of tweaking um mainly because i always approach the single version as one that could be a little bit more polished a little bit more uh you know friendlier to the ear maybe a little bit louder vocal maybe in that I, I i always kind of look at the single as approaching it more and don't get scared people when i say this approaching it more from a pop end of stuff where you know when, when you listen to a pop single the emphasis is on the vocals more right whereas when you hear an album version of stuff i tend to find that they kind of pull the vocals a little bit more back and you can bring the guitars up a little bit more make it a little bit more you know, rambunctious and make it more fitting to the rest of the album. When you release a single, you have nothing else that you have to compare it to at that point. It's its own beast, right? So you can kind of give it its own mix and do whatever you want with it at that point. But I didn't want to make it too, too different where you look at it and go, that's the same song. I didn't want that at all. And plus, the main difference I find with it is that the sound effects that I have started to incorporate in this now uh, kind of add more to the story. And it also kind of, you know, prepares one mentally for what's to come. When you hear certain sounds coming on your your headphones, like, you know, like machine guns or something, it's it, it definitely gives you a sort of, you know, a, a sort of guess of what's to come. Right. A absolutely. So, you know, you've got an album. It's a, it's a collection of songs. And they all have to work together sonically. So mm -hmm. you don't have that limitation as such on a single. But you have a little bit, a little bit less, I guess, uh, flexibility on the album because you want everything to flow, yeah. and you can't, you don't want it to be jarring transitioning between one sound and the next, regardless of the change of the song. In my dreams, I love that acoustic. Mm. Uh, tell me about that. Well, the the great thing about that, um, I've always loved that acoustic guitar. I have a Yamaha acoustic guitar, an AG. 250 i've heard don't remember i always forget these model numbers but it's one of those you know not a super expensive thousand dollar guitar it's really just like a 400 hundred dollar middle of the road acoustic but i've always loved the sound of it and that's the most important thing three hundred dollars one hundred dollars two thousand dollars if you like the sound that's all that's important now the big thing that i did differently this time than i did before and i know a lot of you know recording aficionado people will roll their eyes when i say this but before I used to like plugging in the acoustic and using the electronic parts and directly recording it. And I know most 
engineer guy's like, no, don't, God, why'd you do that? Well, it worked for what I was doing then. But this time I decided to go back, go old school. And that microphone right there, the uh, WA-47 there, which is a replica of a, you know, a U-47 Telefunken microphone, uh, was the, the perfect thing for it because it's a sort of very warm, majestic sounding microphone. And, you know, I've always been taught when I did my engineering co-op when I was younger that there's two places to mic uh, acoustic guitar. You put the, put it a few inches away from the, from the hole, the sound hole, which I've never liked, or you put it where the neck meets the guitar, where the neck and guitar meet, right in that sort of 12th fret area, put the microphone a little bit in front of there and record. And I've always liked that sound. It's a good combination of low end, mid and top end. And you can still hear the picking decently enough in there. And you can even get a little bit of your finger noise in there as well, which I don't never be, you know, against in recordings, you know. So I, I really sat down and made sure that I recorded that sonically as really well as I could. I made sure I used a decent compressor with it as well. And I think it turned out really good. Yeah, I love the sound of finger drags on the strings when they they do come up in the recording because they actually tell you that it's really happening. You know, yeah. uh, it, sometimes they're not necessary, but sometimes it's just nice to hear, oh, there's a lot of movement going on here in this performance. So um, little things that the brain picks up on. But uh, the, again, the intro to In My Dreams is absolutely, I love that intro. And I'm, I'm not going to say anything else on that so that other people hear it for the first time. Hopefully have a similar response to it rather than what was I smoking. Um, percussion, bass, FX, drums, electric guitar, lots of layers, um, which really do in, in many ways for me add to the dreamlike sensitivities of the song. So, you know, good work on that. I'm, I'm not looking for any further comment. I got you on the acoustic, which is what I wanted, but I want to say good job on everything else because it's very complex, um, which one would expect when you're in your dreams. All right, mm. War of Words. This one is a very dynamic. This is the twitchy song for me. You know, that you got a lot of back and forth going on and you've got trusty Joe Bailey back. Um, and I was listening to a couple of his albums this morning. You two seem to work seamlessly. Yeah, I mean, we got a really good working relationship. I think what helps is that we have a lot in common musically that we love, like in terms of bands, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Nevermore, uh, Marillion, Genesis, you know, uh, and there's also stuff that we don't see well not don't see eye to eye but just there's different things that we like that we don't listen to like he loves cradle of filth i'm not big into cradle of filth but you know what those sort of differences are also the things that i think help because he cradle of filth are very symphonic and grandiose and stuff like that and he adds that sometimes with his performances whether it's on keyboards or vocals or whatever he's very you know he projects really well and i think that that's part of it the influences that he has, of course, right? Uh, and this song, not only is he vocals on this, but he also plays the bass in this song too, which I was thought was pretty important to do. Uh, his style of bass playing is fantastic. I absolutely love his bass playing. Uh, he has a really interesting sound to his bass playing because he uses those, uh, those sort of felt picks. They're not the same material as normal picks. They're like almost banjo picks. Right, and it's a really interesting sound because it almost sounds like a finger player, but somebody who has really, really like hard as hell calluses on their fingers, you know. <clears throat> so uh, his bass playing is really, really good on this. I mean, and he also plays on a couple of other pieces too. Um, but the vocals, I'm never disappointed with this, and this is one of those songs where. I definitely needed him on there. I mean, the war of words, you know, there's going to be a back and forth. There's a dialogue going on here and it's not a pretty happy one. So you have to kind of have somebody in there to kind of give it that, you know, negative and plus in there, right? Yeah, I'm still on the fence, but I think this might be one of the most important songs on the album. It, it, mm. it just It's just an incredibly important song. And, and the back and forth is just flawless. It works so well um, with two different, very different voices. Yeah, you know, because you mm -hmm. both sing very differently. Sorry. Um, 
I don't have a lot of notes on this one. I, I don't want to call it a ballad, um, but it, it's kind of melancholy. The riffing mm -hmm. at the end of it is spectacular. I really, really love that, the ending guitar, um, just as it reaches uh, culmination. Tell me about Sorry. Sorry was the last song written for the record, uh, which is interesting because it's not the last song on the album, right? Um, I thought when I was done writing initially that I had everything, but this song I think is important in the story because, uh, and I don't want to give it away what what the topic is about, but obviously there's some sort of remorse going on in this part of the story. And I thought that the, for the feeling that I had as a person saying these words, I couldn't come in and do like a, you know, double bass da -da 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 song to this. It just wouldn't have transposed the, the message well in there. And I needed it to be upbeat somewhat, but not, like I said, not too overly upbeat. But I didn't want it to be looked at as like a total, you know, tearjerker. It's not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be something in between, you know? And the acoustic guitar in this, I was really happy with. I love the kind of strumming guitars that are in this. And the, uh, the, the lead melodies in there were one of the things that I was happy that I stumbled upon. That whole line at the beginning of the song is something that uh, I, I really liked it. I liked the way it sounded. I liked the way it flowed as soon as I started putting a bit of effect on it and stuff. And in the chorus, it really helped. Because one thing that I did, which is obvious in uh, uh, Sorry, this one, and in also in, uh, in My Dreams, is I wanted to make sure that the chorus was very strong melodically and at first when you write the songs this is where i always kind of double well always kind of second guess myself is am i playing something too simple and i have to keep reminding myself up here that the simpler it is musically the better i can do melodically vocally right so i mean it's 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 the same thing with the the, the, the all the other choruses in this album the simpler i left the parts the stronger the the melodies were. And the ending part was something that I desperately wanted to put in. I wanted to make sure that as simple as the whole uh, body of the song was, I wanted to throw in that little left turn and make it a little bit more proggier at the end. Accomplished. Uh, very accomplished. Uh, again, I, I think that's going to be one that gets quite a bit of comment from your fans. All right, so here we are. We're, we're at the end of the album, and... It sure ends with a bang. God of time and design. Here's where everything comes together. After all those promises and Project Hourglass, well, words. Th this could be three or four songs, couldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Um, the funny thing is I had a, I have a kind of breakdown of like little individual parts, like very uh, La Villa Stragiato, where they kind of like put like all these little parts to it. Uh, within there to kind of show what I was trying to accomplish, like lyrically with this. Uh, again, without giving too much away, you know, this is the big conclusion, how the story ends, right? Uh, and again, Joe plays a very important part in this song vocally. I mean, I don't think I could have ended it as well as I did without him being involved in this. Uh, there's just so much dynamic going on in this and different things that you can see in your mind when you hear some of these parts being sung, you know. Uh, I I really think this song turned out well. I, I love making long songs, but I always want to be careful with it that it doesn't turn into something that it's not supposed to be. Because sometimes when you make really long songs, it's easy to go off, you know, off the path into something completely different and then you can't find your way back to it what's what you initially started with and that's something that didn't happen i'm glad that it started off with a certain idea in mind and it ended the way i wanted it to end and you know again there's a little twist at the very very end there 
and I, I'm glad I kind of threw that in. That was sort of like a, not a last minute thing, but I wasn't 100% sure if I was just going to leave that in as a written thing in the booklet for you to come across or if I was going to actually present it musically. Yeah, and and having the subparts, this is more necromancer rather than fountain of Lamneth, with yeah. <laughs> with its eight how many is it, eight nine ten parts in in that whole side of the album, twenty minutes long anyway. Um, yeah, I've just given a, a tip of the hat to my favorite one of my favorite Rush albums actually. Um, did you have any sadness when you're recording this song? I guess you would have known that this is it. This is the time. This is the 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 bridgehead. You know, you've already answered that it wasn't the last song recorded for the album. But how how do you get through doing that 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 last song? Here we are. Yeah. Um, well, it it is difficult in one way because. I've enjoyed doing this. I'm not going to lie. I, I thought that doing this record was something that I've always wanted to do for as far back as some of my other bands. And, you know, the great thing about being a one man band is I don't have to argue and convince people that it is a good idea to do this. I just do it and that's it. Right. And I'm glad I did it. I enjoyed doing this record. Uh, a lot of people have messaged me and said that they really enjoyed these records and that list, they listen to them quite a bit still and are anticipating book three to see how it ends. That to me is the greatest reward of doing this is just people's reaction to it. And them saying that, you know what? I love listening to it. And every time I'm done listening book two, I'm like, oh, how's it going to end? How's it going to end? So now they're going to have an ending. And, you know, I hope that they're going to be happy with the ending. Now, don't get me wrong. This is the end of this. But... You know, I've always had people messaging me saying, you know, Mark, why don't you do a prequel? Or Mark, why don't you do something before? Like, why don't you write a story about what, how the how the thing, ha like what happened after they did leave? You know, like, just why don't you, you know, there's so many ideas people have been giving me. And I'm like, look, this is its own story. I left that little thing at the very end of this album to sort of leave a little light like a crack of light at the door for if maybe I want to come back to this somehow later, maybe, you know, five, six records later, I could, but I don't have to. I know it's always rude when you're about to release an album and people are telling you, well, what about this? What about that? Um, I, I want to <laughs> make one recommendation to my fellow listeners of the album here. Start with several listens of book three and then queue it up with book one and two and give it the, the full run through. But I, w I do want to talk about past and future because you've released single mixes for Magic World, Sacred Sons, The Holy Shield. You also did the Record Store Day single mix for Children of Hope, which had a bonus track, which I believe was uh, an outtake, wasn't it? The deed is done. Didn't that at one point fit into the story? Are there leftovers on the cutting room floor from throughout this? And you don't have to comment on it if you don't want to at this point. Um, and Or ideas that you pruned out during the creative process that maybe you will one day want to sit back and, you know, maybe fill in areas or um, say, I, I want to tell this part in a little bit more detail. Um, yeah, there's been a couple of songs that have been taken out for certain reasons not because they weren't good it's just because either they didn't fit lyrically at the time when i wrote it or maybe they weren't done enough like in my mind like i don't think i, I had it quite right at the time when i was re recording it so i left it off uh but there are there is one song on this album that didn't make it uh onto this record but is going to make an appearance because that's the one that david donnelly played on and I want him, I mean, he played really, really spectacularly on this song. It, it's almost, it almost brings a tear to my eye that I wasn't able to somehow squeeze it in to this because it, it was kind of treading the same lyrical ground, this one that I'd already had. So it would have been like repeating myself if I put this song in there. And plus it did my no, 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 longer than 42 minutes if I would have had it, right? So... I had to make that choice, but, and if David's watching this, which I'm sure he probably will be, you're, that song will be on a release. I'm not going to say yet what it's going to be, but I've already had this kind of plan going on of what I'm going to do with these 
individual songs, like even the one that you uh, mentioned, Adidas Done, and this one, I have a kind of idea of what I'm going to do with these songs. And that's going to be in the future. And that's as much as the future as I want to cover in this conversation, because I think the important part now is the release is a couple of weeks out, January the 21st. This album is out. I think it's time for, you know, us to savor it and enjoy it. You know, I, I've had five listens this morning since I, I got up. You know, I've, I, I've listened to this album, I think, 12 times in total now, and it's been wow. mixed in with all three volumes of it uh, for at least three runs. So then I started getting a little bit confused because, you know, having all of the story going in one shot before having a conversation with you um, was a little bit too much for my processing power to handle. So I want people to enjoy it. Let's leave that there. Uh, just give us a reminder where people can find you, and also if you do have anything else queued up to let us know know what your plans are um for your updates okay great so again the best place to find me is uh on facebook i have a project gemini group a project gemini fan page i hate that term fan i should have called it a supporter page but anyways that's what's what it technically is considered on facebook a fan page um also there's the Rifical records page as well all this stuff is updated and is very current. As soon as I do a pre-order or I start anything or release anything, it is on there within minutes. Um, also, Bandcamp is very good place to go and uh, find information. If you're not like a uh, like uh, if you haven't added my page to your uh, membership there, please do so because I also do a lot of community posts from there that go to everybody who signed up to my page there. So, and I have like you know, about 300 people on there. So, and and, it, it, and it's a good place to get information about new releases and other things that I do and put out. So, uh, yeah. And you mentioned, if I wanted to mention anything else, obviously for this record, there's going to be, you know, a digital release. There's going to be a CD release. There will be a vinyl one. Of course, there's going to be, that one's going to have to probably be a little bit of a longer wait because the way the vinyl is, but... There's also going to be, for the first time, a picture disc version of this album as well. And also, I, and I announced this on my Facebook page, that I am going to go back throughout all of 2022 and re-release all the records on picture disc. I know that a lot of people have been really excited messaging me about that, saying, when can I start pre-ordering? I haven't even started that yet. So don't worry about that. You'll have plenty of notice about that and I'm really excited about that end of things because lots of people were mentioning that even from the very beginning like your artwork on these albums are so good they would translate really nicely to a picture disc and I was like, I'm like hmm, okay but I hadn't known anybody who had that option to do it and now that I have this option available to me I mean I'm, I'd be a fool not to jump on it right so uh, and just to make sure that uh, people understand that uh, I've thoroughly listened to a few of these picture discs by this person. It's the same person who does my lace cut records. She's the one who does the picture discs. Okay. So, and I wanted to make sure that this is not something that's going to be audio wise a turd. And it's not. It sounds absolutely fantastic. Probably one of the best picture discs I've ever heard. Okay. So, if you're going to go in, with this then don't have the fear of like oh i'm buying it just strictly as an art piece you can buy this as a actual listening piece it will be fidel the fidelity will be that good that's awesome i'm very excited about that i totally agree with that artwork and also your artwork uh for dark monarchy and uh, mm. uh other releases would look fantastic in that format as well but let's get through this release and enjoy this album <laughs> because we know you're always working you're always writing no doubt you're already writing new music for new things anyway because you just don't seem to stop um which is great long made those creative juices flow mark anthony k project gemini in the year 3073 book three out january the 21st thank you for joining me thank you very much julian
Thank you for watching or listening to this episode. Be sure to subscribe to us, like us, or even leave us a review. You can find us and join the conversation on Facebook. <laughs>